living in the last moments of Earth's history. God is going to set up His kingdom on Earth. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand to reach every hamlet, every village, every man, every child, every person in India, every person in South America must hear these three angels' messages. These are stories that illustrate the kind of fabric of character and perseverance that we need to go through the tribulation just as certainly as they did. The Bible makes it very clear we are living in an unusual hour. The last grains of sand are trickling through the hourglass of time and the door of probation is about to swing shut. We need to understand this very important hot potato subject, and that is the Antichrist beast of Revelation 13 and 666. Well, who is the Antichrist? There has been so much conjecturing, so much uh, heated debate, uh, so many raging opinions swirling around in the Christian community. Uh, and, uh, you know, they said, well, Bill Gates, maybe he is the guy because he's the wealthiest person on earth. Well, no longer, so maybe he's not the Antichrist. And uh, some said it was John F. Kennedy. Some say, no, it's Nero, way in the distant past. Some say, oh, it was Napoleon. Some say it must have been Gorbachev. It must be Gorbachev because he's got that mark on his head. All right, don't believe any, everything you hear. Will the real Antichrist please stand up? How many remember the program to tell the truth? Do you remember that program, To Tell the Truth? While I was growing up years ago, there was a popular television program that was called, everybody say it with me, To Tell the Truth. And you remember there were three or four familiar Hollywood celebrities who would try to figure out who among three guests there on the panel was telling the truth since they all claimed to be the same person. And the celebrities were allowed to ask some very probing questions, guided and supervised by a moderator. They asked probing questions, then there was, their time was up, and they all selected one of the three. You could only have one vote. And they were either right or they were dead wrong. When the moderator asked for the real, genuine person who was telling the truth to stand up, many times the truth was surprising and downright shocking. So millions of people watched the program, like you and I, to see how good their guessing was about who was telling the truth. Do you think you had a good battering average? Well, okay. And uh, so who was the real uh, school superintendent uh, who did great things? Who was that real popular, or I should say, <laughs> that real uh, major inventor, or that uh, astute scientist, or that prestigious admiral? Will the real person stand up? How many remember? How many remember the, the, the suspense? I mean, it, it was very thick. And how many remember that you would see all of them start to get up or want, and then lo and behold, you're confused, and then a couple of them sit down completely, and there's one lone figure, and either you are right or you are wrong. Well, guess what? Don't expect the Antichrist to stand up and say, all right, I'm the Antichrist to tell the truth, you got to really study the Word of God. But the Bible says Jesus declared, and it comes ringing down the quarters of time to us tonight, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free from a lot of false opinions prevailing in the Christian community. A popular belief gaining credibility and popularity among Christians is that the Antichrist is yet to come in the future. You may have heard of this opinion that's becoming very, very popular. Would the Antichrist be revealed before or after Jesus comes for his bride, the church? For the answer, let's go to the scriptures. If it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, we don't want it. All right, so we're going there to 2 Thessalonians. This is in the writings of Paul, uh, the preacher to the Gentiles, and we're looking there at 2 Thessalonians, all right? Give you a moment to locate that. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and looking there at verses 1 to 4. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you that you not be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Notice, let no one deceive you about the timing or the sequence, I should say, of the coming of Christ, our gathering together to him. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, the second coming of Christ, will not come unless something happens first. So Paul is talking about sequence. Everybody say sequence. What's the lineup of final events? It's crucial to understand because there would be prevalent deceptions, widespread rampant deceptions in regard to the sequence of events. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless what happens first? The falling away comes first. So Paul is really making an issue here about proximity of time. The framework or the prophetic timeline here. And I want you to notice here, falling away comes from the Greek word. New Testament uh, was written in uh, Greek. And it, it says here, falling away. That comes from the Greek word apostasia. Now you know some Greek. Apostasia. What does that word sound like to you? Apostasy. Now you know a little Greek. So apostasy, that is to say, and Paul coined it in another, uh, another uh, book in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he talks about people would go away from the truth. That's apostasy. Paul forecast a formidable apostasy taking place, unfolding in the Christian church. And so I want you to notice here, there'd be this falling away that comes first, an apostasy, and out of the melting pot of that apostasy, the man of lawlessness, or the man of sin that is known for promoting and propagating and perpetrating an attack on the standard of what is right and wrong, what tells you what sin is. The law of God. That's why this this man, this Antichrist, is known as the man of sin. So I want you to notice, is revealed the son of perdition. There is only one other person in the New Testament that was given that label Son of perdition. Can anyone tell me? Now, this is really testing the fabric of your understanding of Scripture. I'll give you a clue. It's in John 17, verse 12. It's, uh, it was given there in the context of Christ's intercessory prayer where he called who? The son of perdition. Judas Iscariot. Very good. Judas Iscariot was a type or a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. Judas was within the church. He was influential, and he did his darkest deed under the cloak of night. And he betrayed Jesus with a punch. He betrayed him with a what? With a kiss. So the Antichrist would be parallel. The Antichrist would be like a repeat performance, a dreadful deja vu. And so I want you to notice here, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Uh, Judas Iscariot personified, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God says, notice here, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, that's a Christian community, showing himself that he is God. Is he God, yes or no? No, but is he acting like he's God? And we'll discover tonight just how that played out and just how the Antichrist has acted as if, masquerades as if, it is God. And so, since we are going through the tribulation, because the Bible makes it very clear, we are not gathered together to be with the Lord until the Antichrist does his dark deeds uh, in the last days of earth's history. So since we are going through the tribulation, we must prepare for these final tests and events. Now, I'm here to tell you, my kids go to school, uh, particularly my son, Caleb, fifth grader, he has tests. 
He has quizzes. And, that, and let me tell you something, he's got to be prepared for it. How many believe the final exam for Christians is just around the corner? Isn't that true? I'm going to agree. There's not going to be the graduation uh, ceremony of the marriage supper of the Lamb. How many agree? The marriage supper of the Lamb, that's a a celebration, a graduation. Amen? That graduation is not going to come until the preparation for the tribulation. The tribulation tests the fabric of our faith. And those who pass the test, Matthew 24, 13, he who endures unto the end, the same shall be saved and go through that glorious celestial graduation. How many are going to meet me at the banquet table? Amen? And so, listen, we know that the Antichrist has been around a long time. How do we know that? Because in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals a year, according to the biblical precedent of Ezekiel 4.6 and Numbers 14.34. And so the Bible explains itself. Prophecy is of no private interpretation, according to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 19 to 21. So the Bible makes it very clear that the Antichrist would have a reign of terror for 1260 days, which equal years in the context of Bible prophecy. Just like, you know, how many have maps? How many like to go traveling, all right? And uh, we do, a, my wife and I, we do a lot of traveling and the kids. And uh, let me tell you something, one of my favorite things to look at, and I think my kids are starting to uh, find this contagious as well, we love to look at maps in our family. And then we discovered that there is usually a scale by which you can determine distances. Well, in God's prophetic map, there's a scale. One prophetic day equals a literal what class? A year. That's right. And I gave you the biblical precedent for that. So 1,260 years, not even Methuselah lived that long. So when we're talking about the Antichrist, we're not talking about a singular person. We're talking about a succession of men that would speak for an institution, a power that would be dominant down through the Dark Ages. That's right. Therefore, the Antichrist has been around for a long time. During the Dark Ages, it would dominate the world. You can expect to see the Antichrist revealed in the world before Jesus comes for his believers. Now, we know that the Antichrist, therefore, is alive and well on planet Earth. We know the Antichrist has been around. It has its roots in the distant past. But we know it's going to fulfill uh, more of Bible prophecy by its final dark deeds in the world. So it is a dangerous, subtle snare of the enemy to allure us into believing that the Antichrist is yet future. Is this making sense? Yes or no? Are you with me thus far? All right, this is not rocket science. We can do this. So therefore, be prepared for some things, some shocking insights from God's word about the Antichrist who has infiltrated the Christian church. It is one of the most serious warnings for us in our day in the book of Revelation. We're talking now, tonight, about the three angels' message, and this is earth's final call from heaven's throne room. Take your Bible and turn with me to the heart, the center of the book of Revelation. Everybody say Revelation. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12, all right? Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The gospel is the truth. How many have ever heard the expression, the gospel truth? This is the gospel. The word gospel means truth. And all truth comes from the Lord himself. All truth leads us to Jesus. He is the truth, John 14, 6. So I want you to notice here, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It's a worldwide message that must be preached to earth's remotest bounds, to cross over every language barrier, and to reach every hamlet, every village, every man, every child, every person in India, every person in South America must hear these three angels' messages to be prepared for the harvest of the world. 
the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so look at verse 7. Saying with a soft voice. Ah, come on here, Missouri. Saying with a loud voice. Notice here. Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment has come. Everybody together on this part. And worship Him who made, Creator, heaven and earth, and the sea and the springs of waters. Now let's drop down to verse 9. Third angel's message in stark contrast. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the, not the Creator in this place, but worships the, by antithesis, the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascend forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, zero in on how God graphically describes who is going to preach these messages, who are not going to get the mark of the beast, who are going to resist the pressure that comes from the Antichrist. Would you like to be among the group that prevail? Verse 12. Here is the patience. The word patience there means perseverance or endurance. Here are those who don't give up despite the peer pressure. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God no matter what the commandments of men are that may clash with it. Keep the commandments of God and they have the genuine 100% proof faith of Jesus. Notice how the faith of Jesus leads to obedience to God. Because faith without works is dead, James 2.26. The Bible makes it very clear, if we are in Christ, there will be the fruits of obedience, John 15, 1-8. So notice what's going to happen after these messages go around the world. Verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle, coming as a heavenly harvester. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice, him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe and ready. Can you say amen? Ready for the picking. So what is going to ripen all people in the last days? There are going to be those who are ripen to go home to be with the Lord, and those who are ripened to be destroyed by the brightness of His coming. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. There'll be those who are happy to see the Lord, and those who cry out to the mountains and rocks to hide them from the face of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 6, 14 to 17. So the Bible makes it very clear. The world is polarized into two sides, two camps, two groups. Those who believe these three angels' messages and resist the mark of the beast. They get the seal of God. And they're ready for glory. They're ready when Jesus comes. And the opposite of that is true. Those who get cower under the pressure, those who cave into the pressure, those who go along with the infamous mark of the beast, go along with the majority in the masses, go along with the, when the government says, you cannot buy or sell unless you go along with the mark of the beast. All right, we'll buy, we'll, we'll go ahead and go along with the mark of the beast. Then the Bible says they get the seven last plagues, they go to the lake of fire. They are fully ripe for destruction. How many can see either you're ready for Jesus to come or you're ready to be destroyed at the brightness of his coming? There's only two groups. And the three angels' messages spotlights those who are going to be saved at last. They keep the commandments of God. They have faith in Jesus. They have endurance that says, no matter what I go through, no matter what people may say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24 and verse 15. Sudden changes are about to catch the world by surprise. Amazing Bible prophecies are fast fulfilling. Do ancient prophecies predict a sudden economic collapse? Will the Middle East crisis erupt into World War III? Are we living on the eve of Armageddon? 
How will the final moves of the Antichrist affect you? What is the future of the United States of America? How will natural disasters usher in the mark of the beast? Now you can watch the entire Amazing Prophecy series of 32 hope-filled messages on DVD. Don't guess about the future, know the future. The complete set of DVDs is available for a gift of $60 or more. Call us at 1-855-336-FREE or you can send a check or money order to Forever Free Ministries, 2001 Monroe Park, Corinth, Texas, 76208. You can also visit us online at foreverfreeministries.org. So the Antichrist wants worship. Our Creator wants and deserves worship. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 and Revelation 5 verse 11 and 12 makes it very clear why you should worship the Lamb. Notice I'm quoting the book of Revelation. You ought to keep track of how often I'm quoting the book of Revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because I recognize this is a prophecy seminar. And if you're really in tune, you're going to hear me refer a lot to Daniel and Revelation. Now listen carefully. The lamb is worthy of our worship because he created us. Worthy is the lamb, uh, the lamb because worthy is him who made us. Revelation 4.11. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. He's worthy because he died for me and for you. Amen? So majority, so we're dealing with worship and who really deserves worship. Majority are always falling for error. What is the central issue showcased in Revelation 14, 6, 7, 9, and 10. Either you're going to worship the Creator or you will worship the beast, either by decision or by default. What warning did Jesus give about deceptions in the last days? For many will come in my name, in the name of Christ, under Christian pretense, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many, Matthew 24, 5. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Keep in mind, the Antichrist is in the Christian community. Matthew 7 and verse 15. Acts 20, 29, and 30 makes it very clear there would be wolves in the church that would ravage and, and, and would uh, exploit and, uh, and do devastation and havoc in the church. And so... Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 and 4, we already read it, there would be deception within the church. And out of that deception would come the Antichrist. Keep in mind, Judas Iscariot was a son of perdition. Would you agree? He healed people. Don't you doubt that for a minute. My Bible tells me that Jesus sent the disciples out to preach and teach and work miracles in his name, and they came out, came back ecstatic, saying, wow, even demons are subject to us. They work miracles. And Jesus said, well, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So I can see, I can see people that really looked up to Judas along with the other disciples. Judas was... One of the most influential because he handled the purse. He handled the money. Obviously, they looked up to him. They considered he was of uh, unique talent. And so, listen, you can expect that the Antichrist is going to be greatly respected in the last days. Would you agree if somebody was to say, you know what? That Judas Iscariot is a son of perdition. He's like an Antichrist. And if people heard that back then, and their little boy or their grandma was healed in the name of Jesus under the leadership or ministry of Judas Iscariot, they would say, you're nuts. You're crazy. There is no way that the man who has blessed our family, you mean to tell me the person who's blessed our family in the name of the Lord is the Antichrist? Get out of my house. How many agree? Think about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the way the enemy operates. So you can expect that the Antichrist has blessed a lot of people, apparently. But when the mask is pulled off, you realize this is the devil. 
here comes the beast. Everybody say that with me. Here comes the beast. What does a beast symbolize in Bible prophecy? The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. Beast equals kingdom, political and or religious, Daniel 7, 23. <clears throat> in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, we had a lineup of four successive world empires. They're in your history book, but it was forecast history predicted hundreds of years in advance. The lion represented Babylon. The bear, Medo-Persia. The leopard, Greece. And a dragon-like creature, pagan Rome. The ten horns, the breakup of the Roman Empire, or divided Rome or Europe. Now, when it comes to this beast of Revelation 13, now that we have some foundation, let's go there. Revelation chapter 13, we're going to do some detective work, all right? You got your magnifying glass and you got your, uh, your, your special hat. Here we go, <clears throat> all right? All right, Revelation 13, 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. The beast rises up out of the sea. By the way, the Antichrist is a counterfeit of the Christ, the true Christ. How many agree the devil has a counterfeit for every truth of God? Hmm? There's counterfeits. I'll, uh, you will discover the parallels, or I should say the comparisons and contrasts at times between Christ and the Antichrist. The beast, the Antichrist beast, came up out of the water. Jesus, when he was anointed of the Holy Spirit, and the Father said, here's my son, may I introduce him to you. He's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Here he is. He came up out of the water of the Jordan River. You should notice. Jesus had a public ministry for three and a half literal years. The Antichrist has a special reign of terror for three and a half prophetic years, which is 1260 literal years. The lamb wants worship. The beast wants worship. The lamb has the seal of God. The beast has the mark of the beast. The lamb has a number seven. The beast has a number six, six, six. The lamb is king. The beast is a religious king. The lamb has followers. The beast has followers. The lamb wants worship. The beast wants worship. And that's just the beginning of it. Or at least maybe that's about half of it. But there's much more. Notice here, then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. By the way, does Jesus, does, does, does Jesus Christ have a twin? No. No. So I'm going to agree, no matter, no matter anybody who comes in and says they're like another Christ or something, like, that's a counterfeit. I want you to notice here, then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, remember Greece? His feet were like the feet of a bear, Medo-Persia, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, Babylon. The dragon, that would be like pagan Rome, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So this power arises sometime after Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, and it has ten horns, so that is to say it must arise after the breakup of the Roman Empire. The ten horns. I want you to notice here, that the dragon gave him his power, his throne, that thronos there, which would be like a capital seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. This is global, just like the lamb goes global. This beast is global. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? By the way, the beast is part of a trinity. You've got the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The unholy trinity, the counterfeit uh, to the true trinity of the Father, Son, the Lamb, and of the Holy Spirit. 
And so he was given, no, who, who is like to be, who is able to make war with him? The lamb was persecuted. The beast persecutes. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. The biblical definition of blasphemy is claiming to forgive sin when you are not God. Jesus claimed to forgive sin, but he is and was God in the flesh. So he did not commit blasphemy. He can forgive our sins, and he does forgive our sins. But So the lamb says, I will forgive you, and the beast says, I will forgive you, but that's blasphemy. Blasphemies, and he was given authority. Oh, the lamb claims authority. What did the lamb say? What did Jesus say when he ascended on high? All authority is given to me. Go and preach and teach and baptize to all the world. And the beast says, I have authority. I got it from the dragon. Jesus says, I got authority from my father. He was given authority to continue 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his character. The beast distorts the character of God. Jesus came to show us the Father's character. John 14. Blasphemous tabernacle. The beast would counterfeit the priestly ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary by setting up a counterfeit down here. And those who dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb. The Lamb has a book. And if you're in that book and stay in that book, you will be saved. If you follow the beast, you will not be in the Lamb's book. Are you following? How many agree? This is profound stuff you're hearing tonight. Amen? And give all the glory to Jesus because any truth nuggets, any wisdom doesn't come from Mark Fox. It came from Jesus Christ with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. What kind of ear is that? That's the heart ear. How many agree? You need to listen with your heart. And by the way, that's a little marriage 101. You want some marriage counseling? Here it goes. I'm going to throw this out to you. When you listen to your wife, men, listen with your heart. And all the ladies said. You say, come on now. You didn't finish that. All right. Ladies, always listen with your heart to your husband. And all the men said. All right. Verse 10. <clears throat> he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. That sounds like what goes around, comes around. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Then verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for his number. Uh, it is the number of a man. His number is six, six, six. Wow, let's put all that together. Let us closely examine 10 clear clues uh, from Revelation 13. All right, clue number one. The Protestant reformers categorically declared that the papal Roman power was the Antichrist beast. Were they correct in their assessment and conclusion, or was it blatantly false? Let's examine the evidence. Remember, we're the FBI, faithful believers who investigate what they believe. All right, so a power that receives its seat. All these clues are coming from the verses predominantly that we just read. A power that receives its seat, influence and power from pagan Rome. The dragon, pagan Rome, gave him his power, his seat, capital seat, and great authority. Revelation 13, verse 2. Now listen carefully. Revelation 12, 9 identifies the dragon as Satan. But Satan works through human agencies. In Revelation 12, the dragon working through pagan Rome attempted to destroy baby Jesus. The devil used Roman Herod to try to put baby Jesus to death. The devil used Roman Pilate to authorize his uh, death. Uh, uh, the, the devil, the dragon, 
pagan Rome, using pagan Rome, pagan Rome used Roman soldiers to nail him to the cross. Roman soldiers guarded his tomb. Roman coliseums housed, uh, or I should say what became a scene of unsightly martyrdom. Oh yes, the dragon, the devil, and pagan Rome, they were a perfect match made in hell. Pagan Rome oppressed and brutally persecuted God's people so much that the same term dragon is used for both the devil and the power he was using. Did you know that Jesus actually called Judas Iscariot the devil? How many have ever read that in the scriptures? Don't take my word for it. Look it up. And by the way, have you ever heard somebody describe, oh man, my ex was such a devil? It got real quiet in here. Okay, anyway, you know, the ex-boss. <laughs> All right, anyway, who did the dragon peg in Rome? You know, the reason why, that, that was just not a parenthetical thought. The idea is this. The devil uses people. Is that true? Yes or no? The devil uses institutions. God uses people, and God uses institutions. You gotta have discernment. And that's why we have Amazing Prophecy Seminar, so you can know the difference and not be duped and deluded. So who did the dragon pagan Rome give its capital seat to? A religious power that is worshiped. Clue number two, Revelation 13, verse 4. Here's a quote. To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff, LaBianca, professor of history, University of Rome, uh, a number of years ago. As pagan Rome was losing power, papal Rome was gaining power. Down went pagan Rome, up came papal Rome, so now all roads lead to papal Rome. Would you agree? Rome is still prestigious and all-powerful on planet Earth. And so at least that's what they're claiming and so forth. And so um, I want you to notice here a painting is worth a thousand prophetic words. The dragon, we're saying, is uh, in the secondary sense, pagan Rome, the dragon, and that pagan Rome gave its seat to the pontiff in Rome, uh, the papacy. I want you to notice this is a painting by Raphael, and it's a painting, you can't see Constantine, but this is Constantine's armies, and you'll notice they have a standard they're holding up there, and what does that standard look like to you, everyone? A dragon. So the dragon was associated with the Roman armies in the time of Constantine, and that's around the time that Constantine left power to the Vatican, to the papacy. He relocated his capital seat to Byzantium, renamed it Constantinople. Who filled the polit political vacuum? Who got that power? Who inherited that prestige? None other than the papacy. There you have it. If you are going through a personal crisis in your life, if you are facing financial challenges, if you are suffering from a health problem, if your marriage is needing a miracle, if you have a special concern for your children, whatever your need may be, give us a call and we will pray with you. For your prayer requests, call us at 1-855-336-FREE. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. John 8:36. Clue number three, a blasphemous power. The Bible defines blasphemy, as I mentioned, as assuming any titles and rights or authority that belong solely to God. Does the papacy claim the titles and prerogatives which belong to God alone? For thou art the, the shepherd, thou art the director, thou art the husbandman, finally, thou art another God on earth. That is a papal quote about the papacy. Who opposes and exalteth himself above all, that is called God, so that he is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, in the Christian community, showing himself that he is God. Is he God? No, but he's acting as if he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 and 3. The Pope is of so great dignity, so exalted, that he is not a mere man, but as it were God, and the vicar of God, for our ecclesiastical dictionary. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself. I don't even like reading this stuff, but I have to. Hidden under the veil of flesh. The Catholic National, July 1895. Seek where you will through heaven and earth. 
You will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Catholic priest. Now, can I just say this parenthetically? God has people, his sheep, in all folds, in all flocks, in all churches. There will be many Roman Catholics in heaven. I believe it with all of my heart. And there will be many Roman Catholics not in heaven. There will be many Protestants in heaven, and there will be many Protestants not in heaven. How many agree that Jesus is ultimately the judge? You know, sometimes they'll tell me, well, you, you know, you're judging people. I am judging an institution that has impacted a lot of wonderful, lovely Christians. And the truth shall set us free. What does Papal Rome say about Mary? They say Mary is a mediatrix. What does that sound like? Another mediator. But 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. How many agree? All you need is Jesus. And would you agree our God is a jealous God? He will share his glory with no man. And so what is this message all about tonight? Get your eyes off man. Get your eyes off Mary. Get your eyes off the saints. Get it off of a, of, of a church in terms of salvation. Get it on Jesus and Jesus alone. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. Mommy, mommy, who do we pray to? Oh, that every parent in America and the world would not teach their children to pray to anyone else than our Father in heaven to His Son, Jesus Christ. And by the way, sometimes people will say, uh, you're only supposed to pray to God, aren't you? You're not supposed to pray to Jesus. How many agree if, if my little girl says, dear Jesus, would you be with me today? Jesus isn't going to say, I'm sorry, I can't hear that prayer. Let me give you proof. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 7, Peter said, Jesus, receive my spirit. It's okay to talk to Jesus. I, amen. Now we pray to our Father. <clears throat> we pray to our Father. But how many have ever heard yourself saying, oh, Jesus, I need you? What do we sing? <clears throat> what do we sing? My Jesus, I love you. That's a song and that's a prayer. Amen. Daniel 7.25. Think to change times and laws. The Antichrist, the papal power, would notoriously have a checkered past of actually tampering with heaven's constitution, the Ten Commandments, the audacity, the presumption. They would actually seek to revise, modify, alter, substitute the Ten Commandments. They would what? Think to change times and laws. Where is that from? Daniel 7. We already had an entire presentation in which we looked at who is the bizarre talking horn according to the Bible. That's Daniel 7, 25. All right? So we continue. What specific commandment did the papacy change? Here you have a card of the Ten Commandments. And this might be new to some of you. Do not accept anything I say unless Acts 17, 11. You're willing to receive things as long as you go home and you verify what Pastor Fox is saying up here or Pastor Rester. Amen? So there's ten commandments, not ten suggestions. But you will notice that the Catholic version is different from the Protestant version. Now, can I say this in all honesty? The Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church in their catechism have dropped the second commandment out of their lineup of the Ten Commandments. Well, that didn't look too well. Ten minus one is nine. So they thought, what do we do about that? Well, they looked at the Tenth Commandment and said, that's a little lengthy. Why don't we just conveniently, compromisingly, divide it? They split it. So ten minus one is ten, when you figure it that way. 
I'm going to agree, God is not pleased with this. This is acting like you're God when you're really not in the temple of God. How many want the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. If it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, we don't want it. Is that clear? Is that what you want to teach your children? You put the Ten Commandments on the wall. You teach your children the Ten Commandments. And it needs to be the Ten Commandments that are in the Bible, not just in a catechism that has been changed. You want the real thing. the gen- There is a counterfeit. There's a genuine. As for me and my house, we want to go with the Lord Jesus and what he teaches. Daddy, what are the Ten Commandments? This should be very simple and basic. How many agree there are two major basic truths in the Bible? The Ten Commandments and Jesus died for breaking the commandments. Thank God for the blood. And when you accept Jesus, he gives you the power. He writes the law in your heart. The cross and the commandments are inseparable. Proof, Jesus stands by his Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments are right underneath the mercy seat. The cross and the commandments. Somebody shout amen tonight. That's Revelation eleven nineteen. 19, by the way. Now listen carefully. Does the Roman papal power claim the power to change God's law? They do. The Bible says, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of man, Mark 7, verse 8. How does the Antichrist <clears throat> act as if it were God? By thinking to change times and laws. Daniel 7 and verse 25. So how did the Antichrist change God's Ten Commandments, everyone? It deleted <clears throat> the t- Second Commandment, and they doubled the Tenth Commandment. Who are the only ones who do not add or take away from the Ten Commandments? Revelation chapter 12. Let's go there very quickly. Are you with me? You say, Mark, this is new to me. Hallelujah. How many want a new song of truth? Amen. Let God do a new thing in your life. Amen. All right. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. Who's the woman? The church, the bride of Christ. Notice. And he went to make war with the remnant or the rest of her offspring, the remnant, who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, testimony of Jesus, I should say. So a remnant are the only ones who are going to be preaching the whole truth here. I want you to notice, don't expect majority to champion the Ten Commandments. My Bible tells me it's just a remnant. How many want to be among the remnant? Who wants to be among the remnant? Who wants to say, you know what? I dare to be different. Dare to be a Daniel. Amen. Dare to be different. Amen. And so keep the unchanged law of God or keep the changed law of God. That's the choice. So what is the only commandment that has anything to do with time? The fourth commandment. Remember it said think to change times and law. What's the only one that has to do with time? The fourth commandment about the seventh day Sabbath. Let's go there. Let's go there to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, looking there at verse 8. And I'm going to let you fill in some blanks. All right, are you ready? Here we go. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it as a holiday. Oh. How many agree the Sabbath is different from the 4th of July? It's different from just a Thanksgiving day. It is holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jew. Were the Ten Commandments given for everyone or just for the Jews? Jew or Gentile, is it wrong to kill? Steal? Commit adultery? Bear false? How many agree the Ten Commandments are for all mankind? That's why Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. Mark 2, 27, 28. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So it's the Lord's day. In it you shall do no work unless your boss wants you to. Now keep in mind, did Jesus work miracles on the Sabbath? And he said it's lawful to do well or to relieve suffering on the Sabbath. Is it okay if we have hospitals uh, saving people's lives on the Sabbath? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son. Notice how God is expanding on it. He's trying to make it very thorough so that there's no excuse for a person not even to delegate it. 
I want you to notice it. You know your son. Don't be telling your son, hey, son, listen, I, I can't keep the Sabbath, or I, I, I can't work on the Sabbath, so you work for me. In it, you shall do no work. You know your son, know your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Are we called in Revelation to come back to worshiping the Creator? And those who do that are described as here are those who keep the commandments of God. In the last days there's a call to come back to keeping the Sabbath. Why? Because the commandment that begins with the word remember is the most forgotten day. And the most forgotten commandment. But it is sublime. Notice the Bible says here, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rest of the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Sometimes people tell me, well, Mark, I keep every day holy. No, you don't. Because the biblical definition of keeping that day holy is you don't work on that day, and most people have to work for a living. And so listen. Oh, yeah, of course we're God's holy people. Of course we want to live for Him a holy life every day. But you've got to work for a living, but not on the seventh day. So what does the fourth commandment say? Remember the Sabbath. How? By keeping it holy and not working on that day. What's that day? The seventh day of the week. What is that day? Look on the calendar. It's Saturday. Oh, but that calendar's been changed. Never has the weekly cycle been changed. And if you ever doubt that, the Jews keep the same day that Jesus kept, and the Jews have it right. But Christians need to tell them it's not enough to observe the Sabbath. You've got to accept the Lord of the Sabbath. Can you say amen? But you know, we need to tell the Jews. We need to tell Orthodox Jews, you know what? You got something. We Christians can learn a little something that the law of God is unchanged. But you Jews, we love you too. You need to be a Jew for Jesus. Can you say amen? And so listen, three changes that the Catholic Church has made to the commandments. I share this in love. Please, please, I share this with all sensitivity. Three changes. Number one, deleted the second commandment. Number two, made the tenth commandment two. Number three, changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. There are three changes. And you know what? Most people are not fully aware of this. But now you know. Now you know. Does the papal power admit changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? Do they actually acknowledge that? Catechism. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. That's a converse catechism, a Catholic doctrine, 1957 edition. So therefore, Daniel predicted the change. The church admits the change. History reveals the change. The Bible condemns the change. And I'm not going along with the change. Would you agree? If you need, a, if you need to make a change in order to keep the, the day that has been unchanged, then I say change to keep that which has been unchanged. Are you with me? Cardinal Gibbons, the late James Cardinal Gibbons said, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorized in the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. What a candid admission. What did Jesus say? Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Mark, are you saying that all those who don't keep this seventh-day Sabbath are going to be lost? No, I'm not saying that. But here's what I am saying. That when we know better and we turn our back on the truth, that's a whole nother thing. What does the Bible say? Therefore, to him that knows to do good, who does not do it, to him it is sin. James 4, 17. At times of ignorance, God overlooks it, winks at it. Acts 17, verse 30. But you shall know the truth, and it will set you free if you know it and follow it. So therefore, 
Did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Luke 4 and verse 16. Luke 4, are we learning something tonight? Luke 4 and verse 16. Let's go there very quickly. Luke 4 and verse number 16. So he himself, I'm sorry here, I, uh, Luke 4, 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, his habit, his tradition, he went into the synagogue, church, on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. If it's good enough for Jesus, it ought to be good enough for us. Can you thunder out an amen to Jesus tonight? Did Jesus know which day was the true seventh day of the week? Did he know? And do you know that he observed what the Romans called at that time? They called the seventh day of the week. What do they call it? They called it Saturday. The Roman Julian calendar was in effect in the time of Christ. Now we have the Gregorian calendar. But we still call the seventh day of the week Saturday. And the Bible doesn't call it Saturday. It calls it the Sabbath. What's God's number? Even gambling casinos recognize this special number. What's the number? Number seven. Sunday's not number seven. Now, can I go to church on Sunday? Absolutely. We, uh, what's tonight? <laughs> this is uh, Sunday night. Of course, really, this is the beginning of the second day of the week because the day begins not at midnight but at sunset according to the Bible. So listen, did Jesus ever change the Sabbath? Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. We're running out of time now here tonight, and we're going to pick up this message on another night. And uh, looking here in Matthew chapter 5, have we learned a lot tonight? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Mark, there it is. He fulfilled it. Therefore, we don't have to keep it. Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, the Bible says that Jesus fulfilled baptism. And that's Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, looking there, verse 15. Jesus said to John, John protested, Me baptize you? I'm not worthy to unloose your sandal. And Jesus said in response, No, we have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. How many still believe baptism by immersion? Amen. By the way, baptism by sprinkling came from the Roman papal power. Now listen carefully as we close. Does truth matter? The Bible makes it very clear that in the last days there would be so much deception. But Jesus Christ wants us to get our eyes on Him, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Although sudden and alarming changes are sweeping across the globe, you and your family can be prepared to face the future with confidence. The complete set of amazing prophecies on DVD are available for a gift of $60 or more. Call us at 1-855-336-FREE or send your check or money order to Forever Free Ministries, 2001 Monroe Park, Corinth, Texas, 76 208. If you would like to have Mark Fox hold an Amazing Prophecy Seminar or a Marriage Seminar Weekend in your church, contact us today. Mark Fox at foreverfreeministries.org.